is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dairy Girls Season 2, Episode 1. Episode 1. It's called Episode 1. I know it's confusing. I don't know what to tell you. In this episode, I am so happy to be back. I love these girls so much. This show is so good. I'm just really excited. (sighs) This is like sinking into a warm bath. (laughs) I love this just so much. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. So yeah, enormous thanks to Ashley for commissioning this episode. She has commissioned, I think, all of Dairy Girls already. I'm going to double check that right now, but several episodes for sure. I am, I don't think I realized until I started this episode how much I've been missing this show and how much it just like fills this sort of need that I have for something really fun and lighthearted, which it's not that I don't have other lighthearted shows like Gravity Falls is very lighthearted, but there's something about these people that feels so deeply real to me. And yet I'm still like, because it's set in another country and it's like an entire situation that I'm not super familiar with, it's still really interesting because it's unfamiliar in that way. It just really scratches my itches. Okay, so Ashley has commissioned up to episode six. There are only six episodes a season, right? So like, yeah, she's commissioned all of them. The next one is on Friday. Uh, Then after that, the 25th and the 29th. Then the 1st and the 13th of November. So they're coming up in quick succession. And while I am delighted that I get to watch them so close together. I'm also sad because this means that I am going to be done with Dairy Girls again for a while until it rolls around to season three. I got pretty lucky in finishing season one so close to when season two was coming out. So I guess I just have to count my blessings that I got lucky this time, even though it will not remain. Um, But I believe they have already come out and said that season three is being filmed, right? If I'm not mistaken. So that's cool. Um, So, okay. This episode, guys, is such a beautiful return to everything. I, first of all, need to acknowledge how much I struggle with recapping this show without just straight up quoting the show from beginning to end, because that's what I want to do. This show is loaded with jokes that pile up on one another so fucking quickly that it's like, I'm not kidding you guys. Last night I watched this episode and I felt like I didn't stop laughing from scene one until the end. It felt like I was in one continuous sustained laugh from beginning to end. It was bonkers. Like there is, I don't, I have never worked in a writing room. I have no idea what that's like, but I find it remarkable that they are able to sustain the comedy in this show, the way that they do with just rapid fire jokes so fast that you like would almost miss the one after and all of them be excellent jokes. They're all genuinely really funny. And honestly, guys, like I am so jealous of writers who can manage shit like this. Like I know that the thing that the reason that they are able to do this is that there are more than one writer, I would assume. I should look into, I don't want to look into stuff because I like get spoiled, but if any of you have information on like who the writers are and how many there are and how long it takes them to write an episode, I'd be super, super interested to hear that because I frequently just feel overwhelmed. 
I consider myself to be like a funnier than average person, but then I will run into shit like this where I'm just like, oh my God, no. Like there are people out there who are just so goddamn gifted and I am just never going to not be jealous. It's just, you, you run into this sometimes and it's not the same as running into somebody on the street and having like a conversation, but I really will stop sometimes when I'm watching a comedy and like, especially a TV show. And I will think about how I would have written a scene and I could never have come up with shit as good as what they came up with. Like, I know that that's a skill that you can work to improve. So not being great at it now doesn't mean that I might never, ever be great at it. But there is a sort of a feeling sometimes of just like, oh, my God, I am so I, I'm just never going to reach this pinnacle that I admire so much, you know, um, so yeah, this show, it starts off with this, uh, another like voiceover. That summer was a remarkable one. It was a summer we dared to dream. Oh my God. She's so funny. And there's all these people running through with, uh, like smoke bombs blowing different colors and guys riding around in trucks with fucking machine guns and shit. But she's saying, finally, we were saying, let's give peace a chance. And she's laying back in the tub and Orla just opens the door and Orla says she's pretending she's on Parkinson again. Guys, what is Parkinson? I have no frame of reference for this at all. This is so like, <clears throat> she finally closes the door and she, it's just, she, she steps inside. Orla does, and then closes the door. And when she's asked to leave, she looks really, truly disgruntled. Like, she can't believe how unreasonable she's being. And she yells after Orla, and it was Wogan for your information, which I don't know what that is either. So help me out, guys. What's Parkinson and what's Wogan? I'm going to look this up right now, and I'm going to see... I'm going to just type in Parkinson's show. Uh, TV series. A British television chat show that was presented by Michael Parkinson. It was first shown on BBC One from 19th of June 1971 to 10th of April 1982 and 9th of January 98 to April 24th, 2004. Uh, so there was like a huge break it left and came back guys that's crazy is that just me oh this guy oh i recognize him the early pictures of him he doesn't look familiar at all but on the uh the newer pictures of him i remember him from a moment in uh love actually when what's his name is it bill nye is doing like a lap dance and calls him an old flirt. So I'm pretty sure that's who this is. That's delightful. So now I'm going to look up what, what was the name of the other one that she said? It was Wogi, Woga, Wogan. All right, let's look up Wogan. This is riveting, I'm sure. But like, guys, I really think that all of us want to know this stuff. Am I wrong? All right. Wogan show. Uh, oh God. Okay. Yeah. This is a whole other vibe. Um, okay. So broadcast on BBC one from 1982 to 1992 presented by Terry Wogan. Uh, oh yeah. Just, just 10 years. Um, that's got a three out of five rating on IMDb. I didn't know that IMDb did ratings like that, but there it is. So yeah, apparently not super uh, beloved by people, but maybe that's coming from an unfair modern perspective. I love when I like, when I Google something like this, they will show me a bunch of like related to, and there are all these other shows that I have never heard of in my life, but Parkinson is on there. Um, there's also Friday Night with Jonathan Ross, The Graham Norton Show, and The Jonathan Ross Show. 
I really miss the days when we had Sally Jesse and even Oprah, even though she doesn't really count because she's daytime and so is Sally Jesse. But like, and, and there was Ricky Lake. There are like no female hosted talk shows that I can think of at the moment, um, especially not late night shows. And damn, we really need some. Like, come on. What? A, it's fucking 2019. Um, so, OK. Anyway, back to what's happening here. So what it turns out is going on is that w- they are going to be going to this like uh, hands across the barricades like event where they're going to be meeting Protestants that they did not like that they have never met before. And they're all Protestants from like a boys school. So I guys, I have to be honest with y'all. This is bonkers to me. I don't understand keeping apart the boys and girls for school, but then having the girls meet up with the boys for a summer excursion. Doesn't that seem like a bad sort of, it it feels like it's going to exactly turn out like this every time because you're going to be boy crazy. I mean, at that age, you're boy crazy anyway. And then if you go to school with all girls and have very limited exposure to boys, you're going to also be like way less adept at handling yourself around them and it's going to feel extra weird. And so to have them like, why didn't they meet up with a Protestant girls school instead? It just feels like they're playing with fire here. You know what I'm saying? Um, but anyway, we had this amazing, like, uh, opening bit here that I love so much. So friends across the barricade has these shirts that go with us, go with it. And also they have to bring waterproof trousers because apparently they're going to be like doing something in a river. We, I don't know exactly how much time has passed since the end of the last episode, but Aaron's mom's hair is very different. And um, Aunt Sarah also has like really dramatic bangs as well that she didn't have before. Um, uh, The hair is just so bad. Her mom's hair. I hope to God that's a wig and that she didn't like have to cut that and do it. Oh, please don't. Um, So they're all talking and Claire is eating breakfast with them. And Aunt Sarah says, will any of your crowd be going love? And Claire says, my crowd in this really like obvious, like, what do you mean, lady? What are you doing? And everybody is so beautifully unconscious of like the way that they're being, but it's all in such a good hearted and non judgmental way that it's hard for me to even like fault them too much. And I think that's exactly where Claire winds up coming from. But Aunt Sarah says, or can you not get Protestant lesbians? And she says it with genuine interest, like, oh, is that a thing? And Claire says, no, I think you can get them all right. It's just, and then Grandpa chimes in. I heard that Katie Lang on the radio yesterday. Christ, but she's got some set of pipes on her. You're very talented people. And Claire just says, thank you. And starts to eat her breakfast again. Y'all, anybody who has been a representative of a group of people that folks are not familiar with in a crowd of those other folks knows what Claire's going through right now. It is a weird sensation, especially when they're being like positive about it in this way. But it's still racism. It's like, you know, not racism here. It's it's uh, what would you call this? It's like homophobic. But like, what's the opposite of phobic in a positive and yet still sort of negative way? Does it still just is it just homophobic? Is that all you I feel like there should be like a, a 
contraction that you can add to the end or some sort of portmanteau I could make here. But man, it is just so, uh, they really captured it well with it being extremely well-intentioned and, and kind of sweet, but also like, oh, guys, just stop talking. So apparently they are going to be doing this like camping thing. And Orla is taking this shit really seriously, as is her want. She has got a, she's got a green beret on and a fatigue jacket and this flashlight that it looks like you could beat somebody to death with. And Aunt Sarah is talking about how the last time that they went out into the wilderness, she was like Mowgli. She was that happy that I honestly thought about just leaving her there. We were camping in Port Salon is what she says. And I'm like, I have to imagine that this camping trip, like, I don't know anything about Port Salon and what it's like. But in my imagination, they were on the end of like a very crowded, like car park. Like there's it's not wilderness at all. I'm willing to bet. Um, I would like to register my personal jealousy of Aunt Sarah's entire look. She is so pretty. And it really, really makes me annoyed. Because she just has this whole thing going for her that I want so much. And she's older than me. And I am assuming, despite that, I will never reach this again. That she has a look that I like haven't had for years. And I she like makes me want to like aspire for it again. The bangs, the little pigtails, the big hoop earrings, the, ch the like velvet choker, the giant topaz ring or tiger's eye ring or whatever it is, long scarlet nails, magenta lip color on lips that look like they've been plumped up a little bit with something. I'm sure she's had work done the actress, but like, I feel like they're trying to accentuate that look on this actress for the character also. Uh, her eyes are just this gorgeous color. She's wearing these awesome deep purple and pink fox print pajamas. Like, just straight up. She looks so great. And I'm just, I love her so much. Um, <laughs> the contrast between her looks and what Ma Mary is wearing when she's got the friggin' turtleneck with like a horrible, clunky, chunky sweater pulled over it. Oh, God. Um, so there is this bizarre moment, guys, that I don't know what the fuck. And I have no doubt that this is true because it's on this show and they tend to do things like this to point out how weird certain things were. But they have the TV on in the background. And uh, it says in the the subtitles, Donna Trainer on TV. Because of government restrictions, we cannot broadcast the voice of Mr. Adams. His words are spoken by an actor. Actor's voice. Well, with respect. And I mean, if you're watching. So evidently, and, and this is something that... Um, Aaron's father also brings up Jerry. He doesn't know why this is the way it is either. He's just like, I don't, I, I, I've never understood it. Why we, why they like, you know, cover, why they aren't allowed to um, pr broadcast his voice here. Like, what's the deal? And, Aunt Sarah says it's because his natural voice is actually very seductive. Apparently, he looks like he sounds like a West Belfast Bond. As far as English are concerned, a voice like that, well, it's dangerous. And her uh, father chimes in and agrees. And Jerry is just like, are you telling me? That he's not broadcast because his voice is too sexy. And Grandpa says, 
His voice is like a fine whiskey. I have it on good authority, boy. I need to know why it wasn't allowed to brought. Like, did they think that he had some sort of like bizarre psychokinetic power? Or maybe that he could just mesmerize people like a vampire with compulsion? I, guys, I'm, I have never heard out, like, outside of some place like North Korea or China, where there's just general censorship all the time. I have never heard of the censorship of one particular person that was so inconvenient that they had to hire an actor to read his words instead. Are like, is this just supposed like, okay, so my only theory here is they don't want everybody to actually hear what the guy says. So they just like maybe write whatever and have the actor say that and everybody takes it for granted that these people are telling the truth about what he said. When in fact, why would you believe that? Because it's just not on camera. It's just some script that somebody's reading that they're telling you is true. That's all I can think. I really, this is insanity to me. Um, so <laughs> Michelle comes in the way that she do. Uh, the floppy haired Englishman. Uh, he's all fuck a doodle this fuck a doodle that he's flat out going to weddings. Um, what is it that she says? That's what he said when he was nabbed. Um, oh, right. Okay. So fuck a doodle this, fuck a doodle that. Uh, he's flat out going to weddings with his mates until one of them, the fat beardy one in the skirt, until he croaks it. And they're all, we need to show this man a bit of respect here. Let's stop all the clocks. He goes with your woman. You know her. She's a total ride, but she paper clips her frocks together. Well, he was caught getting down and dirty with some hooker in the back of his BMW. Dark horse or what? To which Ma Mary just says, good morning, Michelle. And honestly, Michelle, good morning to you from all of us. We missed you, dear. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> um, so this whole situation with James having any parts of this, bless him. Because he is still being like wrapped into like it's it's really amazing to me that he has to wear the pink uh, wading pants, the waterproof trousers, because there was a two for one. And I love the whole bit of what James decides to do with this and tries to make it like it's all a joke and I'm just mad like that. Oh, James, sweetie, if you weren't trying so hard, you might have been able to pull this off. But instead, you just come across sounding manic and bananas. Um, so this is a point that comes up where I love this subplot more than anything, more than anything. This is a Seinfeld level bit that is e given even less context. Like in Seinfeld, when there's a particular bit that they hang on to, it's always something that like the characters are more invested in than a regular person probably would be. But it's still something that all of us can kind of understand where they're coming from, right? Like somebody double dipping, for example, or, um, you know, whether or not there was a pause before he said it this way, or did he say it this way? Why would Jerry bring anything? Why would Jerry bring anything? Like, all of these little things that people like zero in on and go, wait, what does that mean? It's completely human and totally relatable. This thing with the bull is not exactly relatable in that I don't feel like most of us have been in this position. But it is understandable that when somebody just decides to let you keep something for no reason, that you would be like, well, that's weird. Did I give the impression that I wanted to keep it? Why don't they want it back? Do they not need it? It's a bowl. 
why wouldn't you need a bowl? Everybody needs a bowl. What is she doing? She have so many bowls. She doesn't even know. Like, she just give them away. Is that what she does? Like, who else has bowls that used to be hers? What's going on? It's genuinely so funny because it's just does not matter at all. And yet I completely get why her mom gets weirdly wrapped up in this. So Michelle says something my mom told me to tell you. And Mary starts to interrupt and be like, yeah, 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 I know her bowl. I keep meaning to return it. I'll send it over or I'll come around later today. And Michelle says, no, she said to hang on to it. And Mary turns around and is just like, what? What do you mean? There's nothing wrong with it. And Sarah jumps up and chimes in. Sure, I was admiring that bowl only yesterday. Oh, Sarah, I love how invested you also get immediately in this weird stuff. I love that every character in this show, there is only ever one person on the outside just being like, why is everybody doing this? And it's almost always Jerry. Gary, I always do this. Jerry, right? Is it Jerry? Um, but how like completely sincere most of them are with just being like, this is a mystery that needs to be solved. We need to address this. I want to know what the fuck is going on. It, get your best men on it. Like, it's just so strange. Um, and Michelle just like realizes everybody is staring at her. Like she just gave them the most appalling news. And she's just like, guys, okay, I'm just the messenger and we need to go. So everybody starts heading out and I love her mother. I've already said this to Aaron, but no funny business with these Protestant labs. I lads, I don't want anybody landing up here pregnant to which James says, not really a problem for me. And grandpa chimes in with, I wouldn't rule it out, son. Ah, uh, what does that even mean? Um, teenage, teenage boys can be very convincing, Aaron. I remember your father at that age. And Aaron is like, nope, nope, stop. And I love her dad also being like, yes, please stop. Please stop. So Aaron makes a really good show about how that's not on any of their minds at all. And I mean, for Claire, it's not. But I like this whole thing, it turns out, is complete garbage. They all 100% plan on hooking up with a boy in some way. And this is what I'm talking about. They can't not know that this is going to happen. Right? Am I crazy? Like, you would really think, especially like, like I said, if there, if modesty is such an issue, if being separate from boys for the sake of protecting your virtue is such an issue that you're willing to have whole separate schools for boys and girls, I do not understand deciding to throw them together like this when they are going to be sleeping in the same location. That's insane. What are they doing? Um, but yeah, it's very clear that all of them are very much looking forward to trying to hook up with somebody except for Claire. Claire is being very altruistic here and genuinely just wanting to like, you know, reach across the divide. And then there's James who would just like to have a friend because he hasn't got any. And I mean, he could have a friend that's a female, but none of these girls are interested in being his friend. He's just sort of around all the time. Um, and he just doesn't know even how to talk to boys anymore. All he keeps doing when he meets up with them is like fulfilling these weird stereotypes of what it's like he forgot how to be a person and he read some sort of like lad mag that told him how to have a conversation with guys at work or something. And so he just decides that he's going to talk to them in this incredibly like inappropriate, outdated sort of like, it's almost a, a cartoon, you know, it's amazing. 
poor James. Oh, bless him. I understand so much why he wants to have a friend, even if it's somebody that he likely won't see again. Like, I don't see the likelihood of that. But having somebody that over the weekend he could just like be friends with. Um, but yeah, the whole thing is really cap- like started off beautifully by their visit to that little shop. They're looking for something that they can give to these kids as a gift, because apparently that's part of the deal with this program is that you like give them each something that signifies you're trying to make peace with them somehow. And this shopkeeper, and I can't remember the name of it. It's I remember his shop had like a really boring, funny name. Um, but he is unwilling to work with them because all of them basically want to take whatever and then pay him back in labor later. I always wonder about stuff like this. Like their parents have to know that they're expected to like bring something, right? So why isn't any of them prepared? Their parents don't want to help them out with this or do they just not know? Like, did they forget to say anything until they were like on their way or what what like you know them them having to scrape for this one would think that their parents would be pretty invested in them making a good impression here because of like pride really is the only thing but yeah this dude we protestant gifts i am completely out of stock what with there being such a demand for these things around here um so yeah this scene is just such a great start because this is like, I think also how se- the first episode of season one started as well was in here. Um, so he finally like screams at them to get them to leave the damn shop. When they say that maybe that they should, uh, when they say that they want to work it off in debt and he says, what do you think this is? Little house on the fucking prairie. I laughed so hard because like, what a weird comparison to make, but it like makes sense, you know? Um, <clears throat> so they're all talking about what it is that they have to give as a gift and how embarrassed they all are because it's so like pathetic, half eaten pack of Rolos. Um, and all of this stuff is like they're putting it into the sad little fucking plastic baggie and then they run across fucking uh what's her name Jenny and Jenny has a box that's like so huge it takes two people to carry it wrapped in rainbow paper with a big giant ribbon on the front and it is it turns out because I was really tempted to be like, maybe it's not that good a gift. You could wrap literally anything in a giant box with a huge bow and awesome paper and make it look like it's this big, exciting thing. And then you open it and it's not that awesome. But unfortunately, it turns out that this fucking thing is a keyboard, which, yeah, that's pretty damn exciting. Like, I don't know about you guys, but my parents had an electric keyboard when I was growing up and that shit was the tits and I loved it. And it would play like bossa nova beats while you played the piano. So it'd be like, and then you'd play the piano over it and try and like, it was so lame and I loved it. And, you know, like, I just hate her so much. I hate Jenny so much. Um, so, yeah, they they are all feeling even more self-conscious as they head to this thing. Um, and the prods arrive from London Dairy Boys Academy. The woman who gets out of the bus is so fantastic. She is wearing this suit with this like high collared old fashioned blouse under it that has I think a cameo brooch pinning it at the throat. I loved her on sight and I am absolutely heartbroken 
that I think I'm not going to get to see her again on this show because why would I? I love her so much. I desperately want her to come back. I'm like in love with her. Oh. She's immediately followed by this dude who is pretty damn good looking. And especially like, you know, for the era, his hair is like right on point. Everything. He is followed by a bunch of other dudes who honestly, while not as good looking as him, are all pretty good looking because this is television. And all the girls immediately are like, well, he's the only good looking one. And I'm like, yeah, he's really not like he's certainly the best looking. And I'm not mad at you for like zeroing in on him. But like the rest of them aren't horrible. There's only a couple that are really just so <laughs> this whole thing, the the meeting of uh sister michael with the woman in charge here who's what is her name i'm gonna back it up a second to see if i can get her name um ms turner i adore her i just know i know i keep saying this but i don't care her pinstripe suit guys i want all of it um and i love the way that each of them despite being of a different religion is exactly the same both of them handle everything exactly the same. So, you know, she says to her boys, move it. And Sister Michael says to her girls, shift it. And as they're walking away, she says to Sister Michael, why is everyone so desperate for them to mix? I think we should keep them separate. And Sister Michael says, I think we should keep them in cages. And I love that Janet, as she shall be called from here on out, gives her a bit of an approving smile. Like there's a real moment there of them being like, all right, yeah, I think we're going to be all right. Like I just, it's wonderful. Our Lady Immaculate Girls have been split into groups. A thorough uh, A through F, as have the Londonderry Boys Academy. We'd like uh, A's to find A's, B's to find B's, etc., and so on. It's very straightforward. However, if that isn't clear, feel free to say so. But know that you will be judged. Oh, guys, it's so wonderful. Um, so yeah, everybody gives each other their little gifts, and the girls are all given like these little stuffed animal teddy bears with a pink ribbon around the neck which is really awkward because James is a dude and this is considered a rather feminine gift. And the dude who gives it to him is obviously a little embarrassed, but just didn't know that that was going to be a factor that there was going to just be a random boy at this all girls school. Fucking Michelle, you all. Oh my, I'm going to keep mine on my bed where I sleep in me knickers and then spreads the legs on the bear and the kid she's talking to just says right oof it's so it takes her so long to pick up on the fact that he is like not into it and i'm not even convinced that he that it's just like a purity bracelet i feel like this dude is just like either not into girls, not into Michelle specifically, and was just like, mm, this is a good time to say that I have this thing, or God knows what. Because they're usually, even if you are not interested in sex before marriage as a principle, there's still some sort of like personal struggle that happens, right? There's still lust that you need to deal with. And it does not seem like that is a problem for him at all. Um, and yeah, all the dudes are talking about the shit that they got from the others and how like, you know, the keychains that they got are free. My dad has like 45 of these. Um, and the kid that James is trying to be friends with, it's one of those moments that like, he could have made this kid his friend. It's painful to watch because they you can see that that kid was open to it and was actually finding some humor in this situation. And then James had to be so fucking weird about it. I'll just give it to my bird. And the kid's like, your bird? Yeah, she's really fit and stuff. Right. Okay. Great. Oh my God, guys, the awkwardness. 
So then there's this kid, Philip, who's deaf in one ear. And Claire asks which ear, and they tell her that it's a really inappropriate question, which it's so not. But it turns out later to have hilarious results that I, ah, it's terrible, but I love it. So Sister Michael comes in. According to this, you're going to need, well, they use the term buddy for tomorrow's activities. And I love the fact that when Michelle says that she calls Harry, Aaron says, but that's not fair. He's the only good looking one. And this other dude says the rest of us are right here. And like the dude who says the rest of us are right here is not bad looking. Granted, the other kid is better looking, but he is very symmetrical in the face. Decently tall. Just overall, pretty good looking kid. And I just, oh man. Michelle says, you snooze, you lose, Aaron. And really like beams up at this kid, Harry, who does not seem at all excited about this. Like there is no enthusiasm coming from him whatsoever. He looks like he's in a, like a deer in a headlight. Um, and I suppose I'll have you then, Aaron says to D, And he's like, wow, really charming. James, again, should us two bad bastards hook up or what? And the kid, John, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, will you be my buddy, please? Sure. God, you guys... I love these dudes. I want them to come back also. Can we just have this be like an ongoing thing, please? Because I swear to God, I never loved first time characters that just sort of get dumped into the middle of like an ensemble thing. Like I love these characters. Every single one of these kids is just like, what the fuck is up with you all? I am individually delighted by every single one of them. Um, so, you know, Philip gets teamed up with, uh, with Claire and she is very fixated on being friends with, as she puts it, a full blown Protestant because Jenny was talking about how she's friends with a half Protestant when she showed them her amazing gift. So Claire is just like, oh, really? A half Protestant? Well, I'll do better than that. I swear to God, the fact that they found a way to make Claire very invested in being friends with one of these boys without having it be about sex is genius. And I love it so much. Mordecai is here so painfully awkward. I wanted Michelle to have a sworn enemy in that one pretty boy. Yeah, you know, that would have been pretty interesting, actually, if they did sort of like grow to hate each other. But it seems to be pretty one sided there. Um, so Orla raises her hand and says, I'm sorry, I don't have a Protestant. And she's told that she has to share with James, who's very annoyed about this. And Sister Michael just says, look, there just aren't enough Protestants to go around. Ah, uh, I love this whole exchange. The priest is here. He's one of your lot or the mediators here. He's one of your lot. And Sister Michael says, not a priest. Ugh, guys. The look that she gets, I got to screenshot this. This might be my image for this episode instead of the usual, like, I love it so much, y'all. Oh, my God. She gets this look and Janet, like, gives her, like, a real knowing, like, girl, while she's, like, got her coffee cup in her hand. The fucking two of them, they're just the most beautiful pairing. I want them to be BFFs forever, please. Can they just, like, get married Actually, can we can we make sure that Sister Michael is uh, out of the church and just have them have a full blown sexual relationship and lesbian marriage, please? Thank you. That's all I want. Um, <laughs> just the two of them are so good together. Every bit of this show where it's the two of them engaging in any sort of interaction at all is the best part of the show. Um 
bit of an arsehole, but oh my God, amazing hair. And Sister Michael knows exactly who that is. And it's like, God damn it. So here comes Father Peter, who apparently went uh, went on a bit of a sabbatical after he got dumped by that hairdresser. And I love the fact that Michelle says out loud that this is what happened. And Sister Michael reprimands her not for saying what happened, but for the fact that she did not first raise her hand before saying something about it. And when father says, okay, I think we should just move on. Sister Michael says the hairdresser certainly did. And fucking Janet is over there smirking her tits off. It is so good. (sighs) Everything. Everybody does not want to be here. This entire scene from beginning to end is absolutely painful. I, they are trying to find some similarities between Protestants and Catholics. And Aaron chimes in and does not have a single thing to offer. As it turns out, neither does anybody. Oh, God. What is up with Catholics and Protestants, y'all? You're basically the same fucking religion. Can we all just agree? Like, it's it's no more ridiculous than the difference between Methodists and Baptists. Like what? Episcopalians. Oh my God, you guys, just shut up and just be weirdo institutionalized Christians and get it over with. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. But instead, we have this whole thing where none of them can think of a single similarity, despite worshiping the same God, reading from the same or similar Bibles, and having many of the same traditions. They can think of nothing that they have in common. I mean... Protestants are richer is what Michelle comes up with. And Father Peter is like, I'm not sure that's actually. And Sister Michael says, I would say so. And then leans over and says something to uh, Janet. And Janet, "Mm, yeah, I suppose that's fair enough. Yes, great. Off you go. Catholics really buzz off statues and we don't so much. I do enjoy a good statue. It has to be said. Oh my God, you guys, it's uh, Protestants like to march and Catholics like to walk. And I love that Jenny has that written down before the priest can be like, that's nothing. Um, I want to pause and think about what's in here. This whole thing goes on and on and it's awful. And in the end, He's like, is there anything that we all want to which Sister Michael says for this to be over? And Father Peter caving just is like, and we'll wrap it up there. Oh, Michael, buddy, what are you doing? So then we go to the scene where they sneak up into the boy's room in order to have a party. It's so funny what is considered a party. All we need to do is put music on and Jenny can accuse us of having a party. Um, so all of the girls wind up sort of sectioning off and trying to approach a different dude. And by all the girls, I mean Aaron and Michelle, because Claire is not interested and Orla does not know what's happening. And James is trying to be friends awkwardly and it's terrible it's so terrible so yeah and these dudes were clearly just kind of having a chill night and the girls all showing up it's not the reaction that you would expect sweet there are girls here it's more just like what do you do Uh, okay i guess like whatever they're it's they're not excited they're just kind of like what the fuck (sighs) all right fine come in and that sort of vibe just continues on. Um, 
So we have this amazing moment between D and Aaron where he's trying to genuinely make conversation with her. Um, he, I really like this one. Have you seen the video? And she cuts him off. Let's cut the crap, D. And he's like, what? And she says, you know why I'm here before we begin. Now, this is the one part of this that I found very unbelievable, where he does not know anything about what she's trying to get out of him. He finally says at one point about, are you trying to come on to me? But it doesn't ever seem to even enter his mind until it's like really spelled out for him. I don't really buy that. Nevertheless, I will say that I so deeply appreciate that this show has portrayed young girls as being extremely sexually aggressive because it's not always the case. Neither is it always the case that the boys are. But in my experience, girls are just as interested in sex and hooking up early on as boys are. It's simply that it's discouraged with us while it's encouraged with boys. And so we tend to keep it secret when we start to have that nudge. And I appreciate so much that this whole episode is basically about all of these girls being so fucking horny that they keep like overdoing it and pushing it a little too far and embarrassing themselves and other people. Like it's just lovely. I also love that there is one girl who's gay. So we get to see how fucking weird it must be for her to be watching this from the outside with a bunch of her friends, like just being like, Oh guys, what are you doing? And then this boy who isn't even like jealous at all, this, like, it's not like James is like, I wish there was a girl trying to hook up with me. James is in his way trying to hook up with this kid. And he's just trying to be friends. But nevertheless, he's talking about how much he loves beer and he loves football and poker and, you know, tits. And the kid's like, tits. He just says, I can't get enough of them. But then again, I am a lad. Orla, meanwhile, I can offer you protection. I have a hunting knife. And this dude gets up and just is like, you know what? I got to go. He says that he has to go to the bathroom and Orla demands to know whether it's number one or number two. And then we have this chat between Philip and Claire. And Philip is so obviously not interested in what she's saying. And she says something about how I'm sure you really like Catholics. And he says, I don't. And she says, what? And he says, no, I hate them. I think they're all arseholes. That's not true. That can't be true. It is. They're thick as shit. I despise them. I really do. And she just stares at him like, what the fuck? So they wind up all getting interrupted because, of course, Jenny reported them all to sister Michael. And I love sister Michael. You will get far in life, Jenny, but you will not be well liked. And I love that Jenny's like smug smile kind of fades away when she says that, but she does not back off on what she's doing at all. And they wind up going out the next day to do this, like basically the equivalent of a trust fall, but like on steroids they are getting repelled down a cliffside and they have to depend on their partner to let the slack out on the rope. And I can totally understand why Claire begins to completely flip the fuck out because yeah, this kid literally said that he hates all of your people in quotes that he thinks you're all thick assholes uh, what a weird phrase. And I am deeply personally afraid of heights. So this like just gets to a particular fear of mine in that way. Did not care for it. Um, so she is screaming bloody murder, trying to explain to everybody that she does not feel comfortable with this. Meanwhile, Philip 
does seem to be smirking as he's letting out slack on the rope. Now, it could just be that Claire does not know what she's doing, R.E. climbing. So the way that it looks is like he's just fucking with her. But I really think that maybe Claire is not does not know what she's doing. Uh, and she calls him a Fenian hating madman. He wants to kill us all, all of the Catholics. Look at his eyes. He's a madman, a Fenian hating madman. Don't let the Jaffa bastard hurt me, please. And everybody sort of gasps that he, she used this word. Guys, I gotta be perfectly honest. I have no idea what that word means. I have never heard it in my life outside of Jaffa cakes, which are you know, like a, a prepackaged pastry. What does that mean? I'm, I'm, oh my God, I typed in Jaffa into Google and it said, did you mean Jaffa bastard Northern Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my God. Y'all, I don't know. I don't know where this comes from. I'm looking for some explanation. All of it is just uh, explanations of the, like, it's not even explanations. It's just pieces of this quote being circulated in the context of this show. And Fenian bastard, a derogatory slur usually used to insult Catholics Irish people or Celtic FC supporters or some combination of all three. So, okay, that's that thing. But Jaffa bastard. I have no, there's, there's nothing here. Guys, I'm going to need y'all's help here. Um, Mordecai just said, Google knows in all caps, uh, evidently, but not enough to help me at the moment. But yeah, it turns out that Philip misheard her. I hated athletes not much of a sports fan. And she says, we weren't even talking about athletes. Well, I thought we were. Why would you have thought that? Because I'm deaf in one ear. And she's like, oh, uh, Catholic sounds a bit like athletes to be fair to him. Like, oh my God. And I love everybody looking at each other and realizing that, like what mistake was made and understanding why this mistake was made. Um, and, I love these boys getting really irritated that Michelle and Aaron tried to swap them because all Protestants are the same. And John pointing out that James has been creepy and sort of sexist. Like all of this is so is they really. They have some points. They have some valid points. And Aaron winds up shoving D. It turns into this big fight. It's a lot of pushing, not much real fighting. And Janet and Sister Michael are smirking and sipping their coffee. And Janet says, do you think we should break this up? And Sister Michael says, let's let it go on for a minute. And she has a bite of her cookie. Meanwhile, Father Peter is yelling for them to not touch the hair. Ah, <sighs> guy. Yeah, it's great. So, of course, what winds up happening is parents are summoned to this retreat because they have to talk about what went down with all of them fighting. And it is a beautiful little moment of these parents swooping in and yelling at every single one of their kids in this way. And, of course, Deirdre, uh, Michelle's mother, shows up and all Mary wants is to know why the hell she's giving me her bowl. What is this about? But Deirdre is so incredibly casual. And it's just like, so how's that bowl working out for you? And I love Mary had said, like, I'm definitely going to confront her about it. But when she says, how's that bowl working out? She's just like, oh, yeah, that's great. Thanks. And that's it. Um, so everybody has their arms folded and is looking very irritated. We had a physical altercation during our get together today. 
I thought rather than let it fester that we should talk about it and start to heal and repair. <sighs> Guys, I'm taking a screenshot of this too. All of them, even Father Peter, who is in the middle of speaking, is rolling his eyes in this moment. Like, I, I love it. He himself cannot really, like, take this that seriously. Um, and really, I love the fact, Jaffa bastard, you said those words. It just came out, baby. Uh, why were you threatening people with a knife, love? Oh, my God. If you'd wear the bloody hearing aid I paid a fortune for, you'd have heard what she said. Girls, you were fighting with girls. This is all your fault, Jerry. I knew this would happen. It's just wonderful. The camera is swooping from one interaction to another. And there's still the board that says similarities at the top that is empty. And Aaron walks up to it and just writes, parents. And D looks at her and grins at her and she starts laughing. And that's the end of the episode. And it's perfection. And I really like D. Can he also stay? Janet and D, please, forever. Thanks. Yeah, I just like this. This is such a great welcome back. I love this show so much. Thank you so, so much, Ashley, for commissioning this. It's the best. It's the best. It's the best. Uh, I can't wait to watch the next one. Um, so, yeah, the next episode is going to be on Friday at 11 a.m. Hopefully I will have this posted in time that people can come to that if they want. Um, but guys, just how much have you missed these girls? Am I wrong? Uh, so great. All right, guys. Well, thank you all so much for coming and hanging out with me. Melanie was here. Mordecai was here. Um, Mordecai, who I believe is Patricia, right? I always forget. Um, but thank you all so much. And I'll be seeing you again soon with a new episode. Yay. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs> Spoiled Network Podcasts.